Well, if you are here and you're in the routine, you're probably getting your Bibles out and going to go, okay, where are we going this morning, Pastor? Don't do that. Don't do that. <laughs> because we are blessed this morning as, as today, this whole month is Breast Cancer Awareness Month. And we are blessed to have a few survivors in our congregation. Um, but, but God has opened the door for uh, Donna Guzmik to come on down and share her story and share what God has done in her life through prayer. And it's just a blessing to see you here today, and Charlie and the whole family. Um, you've been through a lot last year, and uh, it's just God's grace. and just so glad to see everybody here. But Donna, I want you just to go ahead and share what God's put on your heart, and thank you very much. Thank you for asking me here today. Um, as I told Bob, and I talked to Dolly, and I said, I'm not a speaker, so I'm going to do my best, and I know God will help me through this. So, good morning, everyone. First of all, I'd like to thank everyone in the congregation that has sent me cards through my last nine months of treatment and the phone calls. Everything was so helpful, and the prayers, I appreciate everything that the churches did. Um, again, my name's Donna Guzmik, and October is Cancer Awareness Month. Every year, I would faithfully get my mammograms. Last November of 22, I got my mammogram, and something showed. I didn't even feel a lump. It was down so deep, but it did show up on the mammogram, and I had other testing done, and it was stage 2 cancer. I knew the day I got my phone call that something was wrong. I could tell it in the nurse's voice, and it was not good news. I said, I cried, I prayed with God, please get me through this journey. It's just another journey in my life. On December 15th, I got my surgery. I prayed as I went into the operating room. Just before they put me to sleep, I prayed again, and I was very scared. I asked God, can you please hold my one hand to comfort me? And my son, Stephen, who passed away February of 22, can you please hold my other hand? I will never forget that feeling. It felt just like God and Stephen was holding my hand, and I know it wasn't the medicine. I knew then that I was going to be okay because God was in the room with my doctor that day as, we did the sur as she did the surgery. Everything went well, thank God. And then it came time for chemo. If anyone had chemo, it's very scary and very upsetting. I didn't know what to expect. But um, I did know a lot of things about chemo. And after my second treatment of chemo, even though I, got, I always had long hair, I got my hair cut. My hair fell out in the shower on a Sunday morning. I was so upset. I was so blessed to have my husband and daughter there to help me through it. Because doing something like that is very devastating. And the thing that got me was they both told me, don't worry, your hair is going to grow back, and it is growing back now. And um, you're beautiful anyway, even though I was bald, just like my husband. <laughs> um, and then at chemo treatment, um, I met a nice lady there. She was almost through her ending of a treatment, so she knew what I was going through. She was an older lady. I actually think God sent her to be with me that day. The one week I went, I was very upset, and she said, Dear, can I pray with you? I said, Yes. We prayed, and she said, Don't worry. Everything will be okay. God is good. He is here with us today to heal us. He will heal you. Don't be afraid. Then she gave me a pack of what's called praying cards. I don't know if anyone's familiar with the little praying cards that they have out there. It looks like a deck of cards, but they're praying cards. Um, 
And there was a couple of them that really touched me. Uh, the first one is, if you believe, you will receive all that you ask for. And I do believe because God has got me up here on this stage today. Thank you. When, when afraid and going through hard times, put your trust in God. Never give up. You have a rough road, but you can get through it. God is always with you. I did a lot of praying in the mornings and night as I had a lot of time to just sit around and do nothing. I read the Bible before I would go to sleep. I knew God would answer all my prayers as he has. Amen. I'm also here. I also have a friend that texts me every morning. Now, this friend of mine, I didn't know very well for a long time, and I think also God sent her to me. And she would text me when I would get up in the mornings. I don't know if anyone knows, after chemo, you're very tired. You're very just laying around. Things are forgetful and everything. And she would really encourage me on those days. And here's just a few of the things she would text me. No matter what you're going through in your life, don't quit. No matter what the obstacles are you face, keep faith in God. Pray, and he will answer all your prayers, and he has answered my prayers. God is always on my side. God is good all the time. I was blessed to have so many friends and family to help me through this journey. The Lord stood with me and gave me strength. He answered my prayers. I'm in remission now. Praise God. I would like to thank everyone. I would like to ask everyone, if your doctor says that it's time for a mammogram or that you need more testing, please get it done. Early detection of breast cancer is very important. I just want to let you know my mother's here today, and she is a, a survivor of breast cancer of 29 years. So she's my inspiration for my mother. So let us, let us pray. Thank you, God, for healing me and being by my side as I go through this, went through this journey in life. Bless everyone here today and at home. Heal anyone going through a rough journey or something special in their life. You know what everyone needs, God. We have seen your work and what you can do. In God's name I pray, amen. amen. Remember also, there is power in prayer. Amen. And then I have one little thing I want to share with you. I had found this at a flea market or something, and I have been through a lot of stuff in my life with my son passing and then chemo in the same year. It says, I know God won't give me anything that I cannot handle or that he can't handle. I just wish he didn't trust me so much. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Praise God. Wow. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Donna. What an awesome testimony of what God has done uh, in your life. Uh, man, God is so good. All the time. All the time. God. All the time. God is so good. Hello. Um, but, but yeah, it, it's awesome. And we're, we're blessed to be a part of your story. Thank you uh, for that, uh, to think about that, of what God is doing. Uh, and this is an important month because also you got breast cancer awareness, then you also have, uh, there's a domestic uh, abuse, domestic violence is another one. And we're going to have someone later on this month uh, come and speak and share a little bit about that as well uh, with us. Um, so that's we're working on another a speaker to, to share about that. But um, as you go to Luke chapter 19 is where we're going to go. Everybody's like waiting. But I just I'm just so grateful 
This is weird, excuse me. But to be a part of something like this, to see what God can do. I mean, the miracle working power of our God and, and just to see what he's been doing in the lives of people lately. Well, not lately, but you know what I mean. It's been months, but uh, there's just sometimes I just need to ask his forgiveness because sometimes you don't think he does anything or he can't, you know, but he does it. And he's uh, just continued to pray as, as Donna said, you know, and he drew her close to him and he just keep on making her stronger and even taking care of Charlie through all this time, huh? And you changing your role in what you were doing in the family. So I'm just grateful uh, for all that, just to be a part of that. And you as the family of God to be a part of something like this. We should take joy um, in what God does uh, in your prayers. And you just throw up a prayer, be with somebody or do something. God hears that prayer and just a whole part of everything. So... And think about my, the message title there, God Initiates in Our Lives. And so we're going to look at how God initiates uh, in our lives. But we see there, God, you know, he, he initiated healing. So let's look at, at Luke chapter 19, verses 1 to 10. Very familiar passage to some of you, maybe, if you want to stand as you get there, uh, as we read uh, Luke 19, verses 1 to 10. It says, Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man there by the name of Zacchaeus, he was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but being a short man, he could not because of the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him, since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, he has gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, look, Lord, here and now, I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save what was lost. Father, we thank you for sending your son. And as we look at this passage this morning, we ask, Father, that you open our hearts and our minds up to your, your spirit and the blessing and the hearing of your word for each of us right where we're at. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. As you know, that life is all about relationships. And it was interesting, we talked about Solomon in Sunday school. And, uh, and here we talk about if you, have a, if you have all the toys you need and all the riches that you need, but you don't have people to enjoy them with, and life really isn't really that good. But on the other hand, there's people that have, they go through trouble and they either have poverty or, or, or barely getting by and they struggle in their life but they're surrounded by friends and family, their lives don't seem to be too bad. So relationships, not circumstances, make or break our enjoyment of life. There's a proverb, Proverbs 15, 17 says, better is a dinner of herbs where love is than a fattened ox and hatred with it. Interesting. So life is about relationships, and our God is a relational God. The Bible says, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. John 1, 14. God is not aloof. He's not distant. He desires to make his dwelling among us. God wants to be where we are. He wants to be where you are. It is his presence that gives us joy in difficult circumstances. 
God bless you. God begins a relationship. He begins a relationship with us by initiating it. In the garden, you read that he comes to Adam and Eve. He comforted Elijah. He called Samuel. And he anointed David. In the New Testament, God initiated by with the incarnation. Incarnation is a big word, and all that just means is Jesus came in the flesh, the incarnate God. He left heaven, and Jesus is God, his son, and God in the flesh, incarnate. He broke through the humdrum of the world by becoming the baby in Bethlehem. He challenged the Pharisees on while he was around the teachers of the law, and he asked Peter, who do people say that I am? And so we see God initiate in this passage here that what we read this morning. Here he's walked, he's walking down the street, and here he just stops right where Zacchaeus is at. He calls him by name. Now there's nothing in the story, nothing in scripture saying about that he ran into Zacchaeus any other time or or, or that he knew of him. That's pretty interesting. And then he tells him, basically, come on down. I got to go to your house today. We got, I'm going to have lunch at your place. So we see God initiating a relationship with a reluctant sinner. So it reminds us that the gospel works and should convince you and I that we have to, that many people are waiting for someone to share the gospel with them. And real quick, we're going to go over this as like a play. We're going to have a drama of the scripture. We're going to have the tragedy, and then we're going to have a little bit of comedy. If we look at the scripture, it's all laying out in this, in this text this morning. And we see the drama that Jesus was just passing through. That's what scripture says that he's passing through. He just left and, and, and coming through Jericho. Uh, and, and it's interesting that Zacchaeus' name, uh, I was reading, and it means pure or just. Interesting. Maybe his parents, they were hoping that he would be, and he would live maybe up to his name. But he took a different path. He was a chief tax collector, and that job made him rich. And we might think, wow, that's pretty cool. A chief tax collector, that's, that's pretty good, right? Well, in that day it wasn't, because the tax collectors, they collected tax for Rome. And he was... Jewish, and then he was, they looked at him as, man, you're just like a traitor. And Roman, Rome did not care as long as they got their taxes. But what was happening was the tax collectors, they'd collect a little extra. They'd skim a little off top and make sure they got as long as it went, and that made them not very, very dishonest people. And they believe that Dacchaeus got caught in this same circle. And so... And he's also a short guy. So not only is he like kind of ripping people off, but also he's a little short guy. So just think of the, the stuff, the social issues that he might have. Because he had to climb up this tree. And so what mode did, did you ever think, did you read scripture, did you ever look like, and something like hit you like, like why did he want to go find Jesus? Why, why was he looking to see who Jesus is? Because he's already, he's rich, right? He's probably got enough money. He probably lives in a nice house, probably. You know, I mean, he's, why is he checking after Jesus? Maybe he might look like he had it all, but he didn't have it all. You know what I mean? And he's searching for something. He wanted to see Jesus. Now, he probably heard maybe that Jesus in the last town he was in, he just healed a blind beggar. What do you want to do? I want my sight, Jesus. And Jesus... Brought his sight back. Who is this guy? You know, the curiosity of who is this guy that, that comes in and just heals people and, and meets them where they're at and doesn't matter if they're rich or poor. He, he speaks to them, changes their lives.
So no matter what his struggle in life was, he was still looking. Maybe he was struggling with, he knew what his name meant, and he was struggling with, you know, what, how do I live up to this? And but what happened that day was dramatic. It shows the glory of the gospel that Zacchaeus climbed up that tree so he could see Jesus. It wouldn't be long that that same Jesus would be crucified on a tree that all could see his glory. In other words, Jesus, you know, he was at one place one time, wherever he was, his glory was there. And then we see that now Jesus' glory can be seen everywhere. And so Jesus, the son of God, stopped. And he's, he's just walking, he stooped so low. Now, just, this is God incarnate, God in the flesh, and he stopped and looked up. He didn't need to stop and look up. He's God. But it's his love for people, his love for God so loved the world. He came to seek and to save what was lost. And he stopped and he looked up and told Zacchaeus, this I need to come to your house. And Zacchaeus received him graciously, joyfully. And so that all went on, and, and we see that dramatic partake, and then we're going, he's going to his house. And the other struggle is there's tragedy in this gospel. Because we see Zacchaeus' heart being thawed. It, it being with Jesus and his life being changed slowly here. But while Jesus and Zacchaeus were dining and talking, what was the crowd doing? What were the people around doing? Murmuring. Some scriptures use the word grumbling. They grumbled. No matter, probably in a judgmental tone, he has gone to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. This is a tragedy of a heart that is hardened. It doesn't understand the gospel that surely they're wondering why Jesus would go with Zacchaeus. Why didn't he come? Maybe one of the chief Pharisees or one of the teachers of the law. Well, he should have came to my house. I've been reading the scriptures. I've been you know, doing what he tells me. I've been faithful, and, you know, how come he didn't come to my place? Why would Jesus go to a sinner's house? Sometimes God's grace, the way we act when we see God's grace revealed, reveals sometimes our self-righteousness. And when God's working in someone's life or, or, or someone is speaking or, or hanging out with somebody to lead them to the Lord and they don't quite stack up, sometimes we think that we are better. Our self-righteousness that we should be doing things or we should be, or why are they messing with those folks? Why are they trying to minister to them? We have to ask ourselves if God's grace, if the grace of God to others makes us joyful, or grumble. When God is working in someone's life, are we happy and excited or are we kind of grumbling because they're getting something that we think we deserve? I, it's something for us to think about. Because if it makes us grumble, we probably don't love grace as much as we love, we love grace. We don't love grace as much as we love ourselves. Because there's, there's times in Scripture, it's really interesting, that you, if you go through the, the, the Gospels and you see when Jesus is doing something, anything from the synagogue to this Zacchaeus, the blind man, the widow, their might, she just gives a little bit. But the religious people, the people that should be praising God at that time and saying, well, welcome, you know, we're glad that you've got healed and praise God, or they're grumbling, they're complaining. Talking about Jesus. Hmm. 
That translates into today. That we need to stop that kind of self-righteousness and complaining and grumbling and praising God for people getting saved, things happening, and, and, and what God is doing in people's lives. And being willing then to share the gospel, be willing to tell our story. Donna, this morning, she telling her story. That was a big step, but God honored that, and she just, this is me. It's easier to talk that way, that story that God gives you, than making something up. Amen? Sometimes you don't need as much scripture as you just need life. And when someone shares life like that, we see somebody move. Are we praising God or are we grumbling? That's, tra- that's the tragedy of a hardened heart, a heart that is self-righteous. And, and it's, it's about us instead of about others. But now the comedy, real quick. We see that after the meal, Zacchaeus, he reemerges and he announced that he's going to give back anything that he defrauded, half of his worth to the poor. But God's grace made this swindler into a generous person. Zacchaeus is finally rich. To think that this brought, this is not comedy, but really, do you think it brought a smile to Jesus' face? That he said, today salvation has come to this house. That the life change. The change in Zacchaeus. The change in each one of us as we come to know Jesus and we, we, we hang out with Jesus long enough. He should be changing our lives. He should change us into different people. Because verse 10 tells us the Son of Man came to seek and to save what was lost. So we have a picture here painted of faith that transforms people. When you spend time with Jesus, we should be seeing the world and God differently after we experience time with Jesus. The transformed faith responds to wrongdoing, the wrongdoing of others differently than our instincts do. See, our instincts tell us to not to admit to our wrongs and to cover them up and to cover up any sign of weakness. There's a saying I ran, I ran into. It says, love means never having to say you're sorry. Man, that's a lot. Don't live by that one. Gentlemen, ladies, don't live by that one. Because the fundamental issue in a relationship, namely, is honesty. To bring the integrity of admitting error. Marriages can be severely damaged by the unwillingness to admit wrong. And a host of other relationships, personal and professional. One of the most painful things that we can do in a relationship is to commit a wrong and then pretend it never even happened. Didn't do nothing. Oh, I didn't hurt nobody. Because since, because what happens is it ends up building resentment and tearing relationships apart. It eats away relationships. So as God initiated, he initiates with Zacchaeus. We see exact, then we see Zacchaeus initiate with others. He initiated with bringing back, he's, I'm going to restore people. I'm going to, I'm going to give back what I swindled. I'm going to take care of these things. Because his fundamental, his relationship with God allowed him to recover in other areas of his life. So Christian, the Christian faith is the ultimate recovery movement. Because there again, when we our, our, our relationship with God is restored and their recovery position starts, then we can recover and we can help others. This requires a lot, it's a lifelong walk, though. It just doesn't start and stop. It's a walk of faith and dependence on God. To think about we're a new creation. Zacchaeus 
that salvation came to him. He's a new creation. What happened to that new creation? He didn't go back to the old way of life. He became a new creature, and he understood that he needed to make things right. But it's a continual renewal. Because we close, the moment we forget our continual need for renewal, we slip into self, a self-delusion of being that I can be spiritually independent. I can't be spiritually independent. Nothing more is more devastating for the Christian to walk as a forgiven sinner who thinks that they can be saints on automatic pilot. We need to, we need God. We need to continue. Independence is not the essence of faith. Humility and dependence are. Jesus still wants his church to seek and to save the lost. The question is, are we grumbling when we see or have the opportunity to share God's grace? Where's God shining a light in our area of our lives today that he wants to recover, to bring back? To think that God stopped to see Zacchaeus. I believe the Spirit of God is here today and Jesus is with each one of us and saying by name, Bob, I need to hang out with you. He wants to hang out with each one of us so that he can change us, make us more like him, that, so that we can be the men and women, boys and girls of his purpose and his plan. Maybe today you've seen Jesus in a new way. You need to spend more time with him or a relationship, something to save. Or to... What's he saying today? An encounter with, he's initiating a time with each one of us. As he initiates that, we will receive it and spend time with him. In the word, in prayer, forgiveness, be restored. Zacchaeus was a changed man after that day. And we spend time with Jesus, it should change us. But the neat thing is, you didn't make the initiation whenever you got saved. If, you did, if you're saved here this morning and you accepted Jesus into your life, you didn't make any. You, did you make the first initiation? Was it initiated by you? It was initiated by the Holy Spirit of God to say, I need a Savior. You asked for forgiveness the last time? Did you initiate, I need to ask for forgiveness? Or is it the Spirit of God that put on your heart that it, what was not right? I need to ask for forgiveness. So we sometimes we get it backwards. We think I did it, but really it's a conviction and the of the Holy Spirit that leads us into that's that relationship. That's like walking down the street and you're standing there and Jesus turns and says, I need to spend time with you. So you look at your life through his eyes and ask him to help us be restored, to be recovered. And keep walking with him. He's initiating. And today, I pray as we leave this place, that God, we realize that God is initiating in our lives, that he wants to spend time with us and to become the men and women of God. He's calling us that we can share our stories with him of what God has done in our lives so that there's other people to come to know Jesus and have purpose in life. A lot of people out there don't know have their purpose in life because they don't know Jesus. They don't understand because they need God in their lives. As we close in song this morning, as God initiates in your life this week, his moving, I challenge us all to spend maybe a little extra time with Jesus. Because I believe, just like Zacchaeus, I want to spend time with you. Amen? Amen. We just sang what great things he has done.
Think about that. We all got a list of great things he has done. We're leaving his place today knowing that he's going to continue to do great things. As we spend time with him, as he changed our lives from the inside out, and also we just go with those grace and the promises of his word that says he will never leave us nor forsake us. We can always call upon his name because he is there in, through the Holy Spirit in all believers. We give him the glory. In Jesus' name, amen.